Okay, welcome to lecture three in CS159, Advanced Topics in Machine Learning. Today we'll be covering learning for continuous optimization. So first off, a few logistical announcements about the class. Um, if you are looking for teammates, and from the survey in the beginning of class, there were uh, several of you who were looking for teammates. We've enabled the search for teammates option uh, on Piazza. So you basically go to the search for teammates pinned post, and then you fill in uh, the, the form and add a new post. And uh, there's some instructions to make it easier for us to help, um, to help uh, facilitate the search for, for, for teammates. So just please read the instructions and fill out the about me uh, field appropriately. Um, sorry, um, please do so by um, end of today. So end of Tuesday, April uh, is it the 14th. Uh, we'll, we'll be taking a look at this tomorrow. Um, blog post guidelines. So uh, we've made a site for, for, for blog posts. We've also put a template post as a demonstration of what a, blog, of what a, a good blog post uh, should look like. That's uh, you know, shown in the screenshot on the right. The guidelines are also uh, have been updated on the course website. And the key idea is to explore a topic in sufficient depth through the right, a 10 to 15 minute blog post. So the, the template you see on the right is a 13 minute read. Um, and we recommend that you uh, basically take a topic derived from a starter paper. There are 10 start, there are 10 starter papers uh, listed on the, on the uh, course website under blog post guidelines. And so these are what, what the TAs and I consider to be the most basic papers in this class, the 10 most basic papers for this class. And to understand it, uh, you could even use an implementation. There's implementation linked to off the course website for code and data, or some of them are easy enough that you could implement them yourselves, at least a toy example. And to basically understand the, the properties of this, of this approach, and then uh, write a blog post explaining it. And, there, and again, you can read the guidelines for the details and also uh, you know, survey uh, possible extensions. So you know, uh, briefly read a few of the follow-up papers. There's a huge list of references on the course website to understand how to extend this approach. And to, so to basically not only understand the key sort of technical concept, but also the context of this approach in a, in a slightly bigger landscape. And this is due on April 24th. This is, in, uh, this is next Friday, so it's about 10 days from now, or excuse me, 12 days from now. And it's in the teams. So you can do this as a team of uh, three to four people. So you know, you don't, not every one person has to do this themselves. Uh, the TAs and I uh, will hold office hours next week. So the details will be on, announced via Piazza to, uh, I'm sure students will have questions. And so we'll be having off, virtual office hours next week. And if you, of course, the, you don't, your, your needs don't fit the particulars of the office hour because of scheduling reasons, we can of course uh, find some other time uh, to meet as well. Um, the last thing I'll say about this is uh, Colab. Uh, so we really recommend Colab as uh, a sort of a, a playground environment uh, for those of you who um, are looking for a place to play around with code. Um, play Colab, which is short for collaboratory, is basically something that is provided by Google Research to facilitate AI researchers uh, to get started to play around with uh, code, uh, AI code. So it has an easy to use notebook environment, everything's stored online, they provide computing resources. Uh, there are many useful notebooks already available online that you can download, made them relevant to this class. So it's a great starting point for those of you who are looking for you know, a good starting point to get into the code and get things working and running. And we have, to, we have linked to the Colab tutorial on the course website and we have, we've linked to example Colab notebooks. We've actually written our own example Colab notebooks those are also linked to from the course website under code and data. Any questions about the logistics of the class right now? Please raise your hand. Okay. Outline of today's lecture. Um, we will do a review of uh, deep learning and differential op uh, op uh, computation, excuse me. And then we'll use that to segue into learning to optimize for uh, continuous optimization, which you can basically think of in a nutshell as learning better gradient optimizers than handcrafted gradient-based optimizers. Uh, 
And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, embedding differentiable optimization inside neural networks. Uh, and then we'll close with a brief um, discussion on how to use reinforcement learning when the learning is not differentiable, which is most of what this lecture is about. So let's start with the first topic. So uh, first, just a brief review. Um, so when we're doing something like classification, where we have positive points and negative points, uh, the goal of supervised learning is to learn some sort of decision boundary that separates or approximately separates the positive point from the negative points. Uh, what what the, the first thing we learned in CS155 is linear or linear models. And this is a one, one that we should all be very familiar with, logistic regression, which is a linear model in this case, uh, that finds this separating a uh, boundary. And we you know, typically train this using uh, gradient descent on log loss or cross entropy loss. The, the, those two terms are basically exchangeable in machine learning. And deep learning starts to become relevant when we start to care about highly nonlinear decision boundaries, such as this one, where we want to be able to find a function class that well approximates this red line, but is easy to learn. And so option one, which we also discussed at the very beginning of the deep learning class, a lecture that most of this material right now should be just review, we'll, we'll go through very quickly. Option one is to just expand the feature representation of, of, the, of the raw features into this expanded form. Um, but we're gonna use option two, which is um, use multiple linear decision boundaries to compose a, uh, a nonlinear boundary. So we have these two red, hyper, red hyperplanes that are linear and we're gonna compose them in a way to form this particular boundary. And that's essentially what deep learning is in a nutshell. And so one, another way to think about it is by thinking about Boolean operations. So, you know, if we want to implement XOR, um, you know, both AND and OR, uh, if we think of X1 and X2 in, in this case as binary features, either one or zero, both AND and OR are linearly separable. There exists a linear hyperplane in this Boolean feature space that can separate and an or, but X or is not linearly separable, but can be separated using linear combinations of uh, and an or. And so we can take that analogy uh, to build a circuit with and or and not gates, which is a negation gate. Um, and we can build the circuit that basically performs X or, even though each individual circuit uh, of this particular complexity, just and an or, uh, cannot actually model XOR by themselves. Okay, so uh, um, neural networks, of course, can approximate circuits. Um, um, and um, we can learn sort of functions that look a lot like, you know, what you see in the bottom. Uh, and one thing that I want to stress is that from the perspective of this lecture and this class, or especially this lecture, uh, we're gonna think of these neur neur both neural nets and these sort of circuits as computation graphs. So each node in this computation graph performs a computation of some sort on the inputs and produces an output. For neural nets, uh, it performs a linear, uh, applies a linear function on the inputs plus a nonlinearity like a rectified uh, linear unit or ReLU. And for neural networks and for differentiable computation graphs in general, the computation that we perform in each node uh, is parameterized in some, in some differentiable parameterization and therefore can be learned via gradient descent. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next few slides. Um, so a, a deep feed forward network uh, is a computation graph, a differentiable computation graph that is many layers deep where each layer has a set of what so-called uh, hidden layers which, uh, and each, each node in the hidden layer is exactly this, an, a node of computation that takes as input uh, stuff from the previous layer, applies a linear function where the parameterizations of this computation are the weights of, those, of that linear model, applies a nonlinearity like a ReLU or a, or a logistic function, and then spits that output to the next layer. And this is a computation graph. And the exact formula for each layer is, is expressed in the bottom right corner 
But this is the way we're going to think about um, deep neural networks for most of this lecture as these differentiable computation graphs that take that where you have the nodes and the nodes are connected in a graph, in a directed graph, and the uh, edges correspond to input outputs and the nodes perform some relatively simple, each node performs some relatively simple uh, diff uh, computation that's differentiable with respect to the parameters of the computation node. Um, okay, so one of, the, one of the reasons why we want everything differentiable is that we can learn the parameters or, or set the parameters of this computation graph uh, by differentiating uh, via differential op a differentiable optimization or differentiable learning from using a differentiable objective function on the final outputs of this computation graph. In other words, we have some objective function that's differentiable, like, lo like, like a loss function. So in CS155, in the deep learning lecture, the loss function is typically log loss or cross entropy loss on supervised labels. We have a supervised training set and the loss function is, de is defined over that supervised training set via log loss, where we take the final output of the neural net, which is a label, uh, let's say one of 10 categories of an image, and we compare that uh, or, or, or distribution over those 10 categories. And we compare that with the true label and we compute the log loss. And then, you know, we, that is the um, that is the objective function, and it's different and it's and it's differentiable with respect to the output of the computation graph. It is the loss function is differentiable with respect to the output of, in that case, a, an image classifier neural net. Here we have a computation graph. It's spitting some output, and the loss function is is differentiable with respect to the output of that computation graph. Um, the computation graph, as we mentioned before, itself is differentiable with respect to the parameters. So in this case, the weights of each hidden unit. And what this means is that we can apply chain rule, uh, given, this loss, given this global loss function, given a differentiable computation graph, we can apply chain rule to perform differentiable learning of this computation graph to max in order to learn a computation or learn a function that optimizes the objective functions, such as minimizes the loss function. And after we can do chain row, we can just apply gradient descent to learn the parameterization of this computation graph. Any questions so far? Raise your hand if you have any questions. Okay. So let's think about feed forward neural networks as computation graphs. So, you know, what, can, what kind of computation can we learn or can we model in a feed-forward network? Well, in some sense, it's like a one-pass computation. A, a feed-forward neural net, at least in this simplest setting, doesn't maintain any state or memory. You, you give it inputs, it spits out outputs. It's like this, it, there's, there are no, there's no recurrencies, there's no for loops. It's just, it's, it's like, it's as if you were just writing code, you know, like line by line, um, you know, it, you could unroll, you could basically write out this neural net line by line if you were writing code. And it's just, there's no, there's nothing super, super clever about it. It's just lines and lines of code, no recursion, no special function calls, you know, no for loops. Uh, so it's, I, I, I roughly call that one pass computation. So um, that's what we can, those are the kind of computation computational models that are encoded as feed for neural nets. If you think of feed for neural nets as a computation graph. Okay, so um, let's think about gradient descent as a computation graph. So now we're thinking about the, we have an objective, we, we, we have some um, inputs, which is the current state. Uh, let's, say, let's say the state is represented by theta sub t. So in the bottom right corner, each theta sub t is one of those blue points in the bottom right corner. We have a gradient uh, of theta sub t with respect to some loss function. And then we perform some computation with these as inputs. We may, we may not use both of these inputs. Maybe, we, maybe we'll just use one. Um, and then we spit out an output um, that gets added to the current state and we get the new state. And then this process repeats. 
uh, with when we increment t. So, so this new state, theta t plus one, becomes new theta t and gets fed back into this computation graph. So this is a this is a loop, this is a loop or recursive computation graph. And so in gradient descent, you know, the, the computation module G that is currently left as a black box is basically the formula that you see below. And we can implement that with, with, as follows. So we can implement the computation graph um, as follows. So in this case, we ignore the current state in the, in the input of this computation node that we're specifying. We just take the gradient. We multiply the gradient by negative eta, negative the step size, because we're in the gradient descent. And we output that, and then we get a new state, and then this new state gets fed back into the current state, both in terms of the, just the current state and, the, and a gradient of the current state, and this whole thing loops. So if I were to think about gradient descent as a computation graph, um, this is what gradient descent is. This is a completely hand-designed computation graph. Every, every piece of this, uh, with the ex possible exception of the step size, um, which you could tune, uh, is sort of handcrafted in, in a very sort of, in a very explicit sort of way. Uh, any questions so far about this concept of a computation graph? We've looked at computation graphs as a way of expressing both feed for neural nets as a way of expressing gradient descent as an operation, computation operation, uh, just to get you, uh, in the mode of thinking of computation graphs. Any questions about that concept so far? Okay. So what about gradient descent with momentum? Let's just play, let's just keep thinking about these different operations or computations in the concept, in the context of a computation graph. What about gradient descent with momentum? So here's a very, very, very simple version. This is not one that's typically recommended, um, but just I just use a simple one just to um, just for uh, demonstration purposes only. And you see the the equation uh, of gradient descent with momentum in the in the top left, where we take a we take an update step um, in the direction of the gradient plus the momentum term, and then we update the momentum term with this exponentially decaying uh, cumulative uh, gradient of, from the past as the momentum term, that's m. This is a very, so this is a very simple formulation of gradient descent with momentum. And, you know, we can, of course, uh, uh, take as input the momentum term, and then we, we, we um, oops, uh, sorry, this should be an add module. Um, sorry, I made a slight mistake. I'll, I'll change these lectures. Uh, uh, after uh, class and update uh, the updated slides. So this, this should be adding the momentum term with the gradient term and then multiplying the negative eta. So I'm missing a computation module here. And then we update the, uh, we update the computational, we update the momentum term to get the new momentum. So this would be the computation graph uh, module of this, that slight error that I'll correct after lecture of gradient descent with momentum. And of course, um, this whole process repeats. And so both this new state and this new momentum gets fed back in and processed as inputs to this computation. This is still a recursive idea. Uh, one thing to keep in memory, one thing to keep in mind, excuse me, is that we have this notion, we have this no generic notion of memory. So if we, if we try to abstract away what gradient descent with momentum is trying to do, and just think about it more abstractly, we have this computation graph that's updating our new state. So this the state theta is the thing we, we're is the thing that we're trying to optimize. Theta corresponds to the blue points in the bottom right, um, in the bottom right figure. But we're also maintaining this memory. There's some notion of memory of things that have happened in the past. Um, and so one question is, you know, you know, for example, if we can we learn a better optimizer that you know is better than a generic way of using momentum like 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 the one i wrote wrote in the uh figure uh in the diagram in the previous slide you know that that's a very that's a, again a very explicit handcrafted way of of maintaining memory and their memory is interpreted as momentum and it's all like very explicitly crafted you know if we just have this generic notion of memory 
and we want to learn this computation that somehow exploits it in a way that maybe can do gradient descent faster uh, than um, these handcrafted optimizers. Can, so can we learn this optimizer? So now we're, 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 try, we're trying to see how you know, deep learning as a computation and gradient descent type op computations as a computation graph can be unified. Um, so now we're starting to see this unification. But any questions so far? Okay, so this is learning to optimize in a nutshell, in its simplest form. And to do so with this uh, memory, if you, with this memory uh, 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 concept, we have to appeal to recurrent neural networks. So uh, if you recall from, again, from CS 155, this is just, this should be review for everyone. Um, recurrent neural networks, are these uh, uh, neural nets that take a sequence of input and produce a sequence of outputs and maintains this hidden layer that get that whose whose values are whose values of the hidden layer these orange nodes are, are a function of not only the current input but the but the output of the previous hidden layer and the the parameters of the this recurrent neural net are encoded in the arrows and all the arrows with the same color share the exact same weights. So the computation graph, if you will, of every uh, you know, column of this neural net is exactly the same computation graph, just with different inputs. So this is a recurrent neural network. We can also write it in the following form, which looks more like a computation graph that we've seen in the previous slides, where in this particular case, H, uh, this is using the notation from CS155, it's a slightly different than the notation we're using now. Um, uh, H is in this case, the hidden node, and it, 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 it depends as input, the, out, it, the previous output of the hidden state. So this would be the memory term, the M, um, that we've been looking at in the computation graphs from the previous slides. Uh, we, could also, we could also think about a, a recurrent neural net as, as a feed forward neural net, uh, as long as we have a fixed or upper bound on the uh, number of iterations, we can think of them in this way. So the depth of, the, of this feed for neural net is equal to the number of steps, which has implications for learning because gradient descent and chain roll get harder and harder as the depth uh, gets uh, larger and larger. Um, okay. So, you know, the, the gradient descent uh, or back propagation algorithm is called back propagation through time. So uh, every output node, uh, which is the turquoise node, you know, it gets attached to some sort of loss function. And through that loss function, we get a gradient on what the, uh, what the um, parameters should be. And then through chain rule, that gradient propagates um, backwards through the arrows. And this is especially relevant for the hidden for the for the green arrows, which are uh, which are the, which is the computation of how the hidden units of the re, or the recurrent units are updated over time. In, in this case, it'll be the, in our case, it'll be the memory units. Okay, so learning to optimize as recurrent deep learning. Um, so let's go back to this graph where um, again, um, the new states and the updated memory gets fed back into uh, the, the, the stuff that gets inputted back into this computation, which outputs an updated memory and this uh, new state again, and this happens in a, in a loop. I mean, this is essentially a recurrent neural network. It's, it's, it's a little bit different because there are a few extra pieces, but uh, in terms of the things that matter, such as applying chain rule or back propagation through time, um, this is essentially has the same architectural design paradigms as a recurrent neural network. Um, the biggest difference is that the imp is that uh, the, the biggest difference between this and a, and a just a vanilla recurrent neural network is that you have this plus operation that's very explicit in the top uh, in the top right. So we we, we what, the output of the computation graph it gets added to the current state to make the new state. And one of the inputs to this computation graph is the gradient of some objective function we're trying to optimize. So those are the two things that are explicit about this particular ne recurrent neural network. Uh, 
that 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 we're sort of we're fixing the architecture of, and everything else is just looks like a free form, generic recurrent neural network, where the memory cell is a is the output of a recurrent hidden unit. Any questions so far? Okay, so let's talk about differentiable learning. So we have some objective function that we want to optimize. So this objective function uh, is a function of theta. Theta is the current state uh, of the optimization landscape. And we assume that the loss function is differentiable with respect to theta, which means we have access to both the zeroth order and first order measurements of theta for, uh, of, of loss function at any theta. Um, this is in contrast, by the way, to Bayesian optimization that we talked about in the previous lecture, where we only had zeroth order measurements of the loss function. Here we're assuming we have both the zeroth order and first order measurements of the loss function. Um, we have a, this differentiable computation graph, I'll call it G, and G is parameterized by uh, a set of differentiable parameters, I'll call that phi. And it outputs both this delta offset of the state and this updated uh, recurrent output. And then the part that's hard coded in this computation graph is the second bullet point, where, where the new state is the, is equal to the current state plus the plus the output plus this offset or update to the state. So that part is hard coded in this computation graph. The the rest is is just this generic differentiable computation graph. And so we assume that the outputs of G are differentiable with respect to the parameters of G. And we assume that the inputs of G are differentiable with respect to the parameters of G. Or maybe I wrote, maybe I wrote this backwards. The parameters of G are differentiable with respect to the outputs and inputs. I may have written this sentence backwards, um, these sentences backwards. The, 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 the key property, the key, the key uh, consequence is that we can do chain rule recursively, back propagation through time to be able to estimate uh, to be able to estimate uh, phi in a differentiable learning way. So therefore, uh, by chain rule, if we can compute the gradient with respect to the parameters phi of this computation graph. Any questions so far? Right, so this M term is the recurrent aspect that requires us to do back propagation through time because M is both an output of this neural net and an input to this neural net. So you can think of it as one of those recurrent hidden cells. Uh, in gradient descent with momentum, it was handcrafted to have a certain meaning. Here is just some memory cell that's level, that's going to learn something useful so that this so that we can you know minimize this loss function you know well. Okay, so typically you fix the time horizon, capital T, so the number of update iterations. Um, and then we just train this, we, we just, and then we just, you know, uh, think of this as a, a, a recurrent neural network with some special structure, but uh, otherwise, basically a recurrent neural network. And um, the loss function incurred by the predict, the neural network predicts a theta sub t, or predicts a, does, does, does the neural network predicts a, if you, a, a delta sub t, but if you think of this add operation at the top of this, as just a, a hard-coded part of this recurrent neural network, then the loss, it experiences loss theta sub t at every iteration. So it, whatever the loss function is, at that step of you know, this optimizer is the loss it incurs, and we want to minimize the loss, the sum of the loss over all capital T time steps. That's, that's the learning objective, to minimize the sum of the loss over all capital T time steps 
because because at, at every time step it's outputting the status of t and we're 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 passing that through a loss function and then that's and that's how we do differentiable training so it's just like a recurrent neural network at test time you know of course we have this g and it's fixed and we just apply we just use g iteratively we just have it make predictions where you start with an initial theta and you pass in the gradient you pass in you know some initial memory terms typically a random initialization you or, or or some standard basic initialization you you know you predict a new theta you compute the gradient you pass that back into the computation graph in the recurrent neural network the memory gets updated in a recurrent way and then you know it's basically just rolling out the prediction of a, of a classic recurrent neural network um, in the most classic formulation of a recurrent network this m this memory output m is just embedded inside uh, the computation. So that should not be, M is not hidden inside theta, M is hidden inside G. That's sorry, that's another typo, I'll fix that. Um, recall that in lecture one, the notation it, we, that we used was, you know, we have this theta sub G, which is what we call an, optimize, an optimizer. The optimizer is G, and we have given it an initial state, we give it the max number of iterations, and the output after that, that, that max number of iterations is this notation that we use. Any questions? Okay, so now we're going to uh, take that um, idea of deep learning and things that look like gradient descent, both in the paradigm of differentiable computation and computation graphs, and, and we've seen how they can be unified. Uh, it, um, now we're gonna look at specific examples of learning to optimize. So uh, let's first uh, talk again about the, the, the one that we briefly talked about in lecture one, but we're gonna go into a little bit more depth. I'm gonna revisit it in the context of what we've just uh, seen in terms of concepts such as computation graphs. So. In this particular paper titled Learning to Learn by Gradient Descent by Gradient Descent, um, theta, the state, <clears throat> excuse me, is the parameterization of a larger neural net. So, it, so in this particular paper, they have an optimizer and an optimized Z. And the optimized Z is a large neural net, and the optimizer is you know, SGD. It could be one of the, any one of the handcrafted gradient, gradient descent, gradient based optimizers, or it could be a, a learned gradient based optimizer. And the loss function that we're trying to minimize overall is the supervised learning loss of this larger neural net. <clears throat> and so, um, it, you know, it basically is, once we set that up in that way, it basically uh, is exactly um, the, um, the formulation that we described above. Um, I think one thing to, I guess, to emphasize, maybe um, I should have added, added this in a slide, um, is that um, computing, computing this this gradient in the bottom in the bottom um, in the bottom line for learning to learn by gradient descent by gradient descent um, is you actually have you actually have to do a lot more chain rule because theta sub t in that paper is the parameterization of a larger neural net. So to compute the loss of this larger neural net and to compute the gradient of this larger neural net, we have to do a whole bunch of chain rule um, before we can feed it into our learned computation graph. So that's why this paper is called uh, learning to learn by gradient descent by gradient descent because we're doing nest, uh, uh, two sets of nested back propagations in order to compute the gradient of the larger neural net to feed that in, as input to, to the uh, smaller neural net that's our learned optimizer, uh, who then uses that, uh, who then uses that with, with its own chain rule to learn its own parameters feed. But once you do that, um, you know, this is again a plot that we showed before. Um, LSTM is their approach. They use an LSTM, which is a, a version of a recurrent neural network. Um, 
on uh, this, these are simpler, relatively simple data sets. Uh, lower is better. This is the loss function of the larger neural net that's being trained with the smaller neural net as a learned optimizer. And this is compared with uh, various different uh, gradient-based optimizers that are handcrafted. One thing that's interesting is that, you know, again, you have to set your time horizon to some fixed time horizon during training. So they picked 100. And what you see on the right figure is, well, if you at test time, if you just kept predicting for the next 200 time steps, what happens? And so in some sense, you know, this, this, this learned optimizer can generalize in some sense beyond its training domain. So even though it was only trained to, this, to run for 100 time steps, it can actually do uh, generalize to 200 time steps, even though it's never seen gradients, inputs, or states that look like, um, you know, that look exactly like uh, what it's seeing in the, in, in the next uh, 100 time steps. Another thing to keep in mind here is that, as, at least as a function of number of iterations, uh, this learned optimizer's converge, optimizer converges much faster than a handcrafted optimizer. One thing to keep in mind, though, is that um, you know each iteration may be more expensive because each iteration now we have to actually apply a neural net uh, rather than just you know atom, which is doesn't require applying a neural net to get the update rule. So each iteration is more expensive. But at least in, in terms of number of iterations, this converges much faster. So for example, if you look at the middle plot on MNIST, you know, the, this, this neural net has basically converged, you know, if you, if you want to train something really fast, this neural net has basically converged after about 70 iterations. Between 60 iterations, if you want to just get something quick, quick learn, quick, quickly learn, it's basically converged after like 70 iterations. And you know, it's at 70 iterations, it's about the same performance as these other optimizers after about 150 iterations. So it's about twice as fast in terms of number of iterations. So as long as this neural net doesn't, does the small neural net that you're learning to optimize this in this computation graph doesn't, isn't on a per iteration more than twice as expensive uh, as these grading based, as these classical grading based optimizers, which, which perform less computation per iteration, then this is worth it. That's the kind of that's the kind of uh, thought process you need to think about. Um, and here's the here's some uh, plots from um, other um, more complicated uh, another more complicated data set called CIFAR10 and subsets of CIFAR10. Uh, CIFAR10 is an image classification data set with ten objects. So there's ten categories, and you take an image, you predict one of the ten categories. So that's the larger neural net, um, and the larger neural net has a lot of parameters. And, um, and one thing that this bottom plot is testing is whether or not um, this learn optimizer can be used on a different learning problem. So one of the use cases of this type of approach, this was asked in the first lecture, one of the use cases of this type of approach is that this learned optimizer can then be deployed, can be shipped at, as part of, let's say, let's say for Google, can be shipped as part of TensorFlow and if we're Facebook as part of PyTorch as one of the optimizer flags. If you, if, you, if you look at TensorFlow and PyTorch, there are different optimizer flags like SGD, RMS Prop, Atom. You just pick one you want to use. Um, you can actually pick one that's your learned optimizer. And so if you're, let's say, a small business or uh, a grad student and you want to train something in your domain very quickly and you think that your domain is well represented by the domain that this learned optimizer was trained on, then this learned optimizer should be able to generalize to your uh, to your domain and train faster than a, than a conventional uh, optimizer such as Atom. And that's what you see in the bottom plots where the brown line are neural nets, are learned optimizers that are trained on a slightly different uh, training problem. So CIFAR2, for example, is basically um, CIFAR10, but only looking at two out of the 10 classes. So this becomes a binary classification problem. So if you can train the brown line, which is this learned optimizer, on a different CIFAR2 data set. Uh, so that's what it's trained on. And then you could apply that test time to try to optimize the neural net of, a, of another CIFAR2 problem or of a different subset of two classification images. So in some sense, these are related, but completely disjoint data sets. Um, and so, this, is, and so this, is, this, this shows you that if you want to learn, a new, learn this optimized to train a new neural net at test time very quickly, 
uh, on a related but completely different data set, then you know, this learn optimizer can perform actually in this case very, very well. Any questions so far? Okay, so going to the other example that we talked about um, briefly in lecture one, but just revisiting it in the context of everything we, we just described, um, is iterative amortized inference. So amortized optimization uh, refers um, to a, a concept that's very popular in um, deep probabilistic models or deep generative models. The idea is that you know, in many deep generative models, uh, such as uh, autoencoders, uh, you need to predict uh, inference to infer some latent variable, just like any probabilistic model, or just like in many probabilistic models. You want to do, do some inference procedure to infer some latent variables given inputs. Um, and this inference procedure, if you use variational inference, is actually an optimization problem. So you have to actually run this optimization problem to compute, to do inference. And one thing that you can do is you can say, well, you know, I could train a neural net to predict the output of this optimization problem. And so that at test time, rather than solving this optimization problem, I just make a prediction of what the solution is. And that's called amortized variational inference. This is popularized um, in, the, in the context of variational autoencoders. And in the context of this computation graph idea, this can be thought of as basically um, uh, running this uh, computation graph for one time step. So t max equals one. And one of the issues uh, that uh, Joe Marino, one of the TAs in this class noticed, is that if you do that, then you know, if you only run this for one time step, you get what's called the amortization gap, which is depicted in the bottom, where the global maximizer of this optimization landscape is the, is the red star. And if you run gradient descent, you get, um, you, get, uh, you, know, you get this blue this sequence of blue points that eventually get, some, get really close to the red star this one step learned computation graph where the, uh, with a neural net that's predicting the solution of the, of the uh, is, is getting you know, something that's not quite at the global maximum. So that's what's uh, now called the amortization gap. So um, in Joe's work, so, so, so Joe is thinking of you know, how do we do this iteratively in the context of uh, variational inference, which is a very different optimization problem than um, uh, training uh, a, a supervised learning of a, of, a, of a larger neural net. So um, uh, the other that Joe, Joe ended up using because it worked because it uh, in part because it worked really well in his uh, application is the following. <clears throat> so um, you, you in, instead of uh, adding to theta, we have this gating mechanism uh, that gates the current state, whether and then and then whether to use the current state or to use the prediction of the uh, of the new state, and this dot with a circle is the, is the element wise is the element wise multiplication. So if theta is this uh, multi dimensional state space, let's say hundred dimensional state space, then th then the circle dot is the element wise product. So in so in this case, g one and g two uh, are both um, Outputting, you know, in this case, 100 dimensional vectors, and we're performing this uh, computation on it. So you can interpret this as saying G1 is this gating uh, computation, which says how much do I want to stay at the current location versus, versus jump to the location predicted by G2. And again, everything here is differentiable. And G1 and G2 may or may not be recurrent neural nets. Here, if G1 and G2 are rec recurrent, the recurrent hidden units are implicit inside the boxes of G1 and G2 rather than explicit like we saw in the previous computation graph. Any questions? And to just give you a sense of, you know, what, you know, these more these other optimizers might look like. This is actually uh, a figure uh, drawn from uh, taken from Joe's paper. The notation is different. What I want you to see here is that um, you have these two objective functions in the uh, black rectangles. 
Um, that is the objective function of variational inference in a, in a, in a probabilistic model with latent variables. Um, and you know, this is the full computation graph, including the probabilistic inference of variational, uh, of, uh, including the, the objective function, which is variational inference. The part that we, the learn optimizer part is in blue. And so this is just showing how you can back propagate gradients to, to learn the uh, parameters of the learn optimizer. So this is just, again, you know, I, I, I don't expect people in this class to know variational inference and, and deep probabilistic models. This is just to show you that if you, you can set up really complicated differentiable optimization problems and then figure out the right way to feed gradients back into the learn optimizer and, the tre and train, the learn op train the optimizer in a fully differentiable way. That's, that's, the, that's the essence I'm trying to convey by showing you this diagram. And so some empirical results. So um, um, because in this field um, of variational inference, this learned optimizer th that, that gets applied for one step is called amortized variational inference. Uh, Joe calls this line of work iterative amortized inference or iterative inference, so where, you, where you apply this neural net of, uh, multiple times. Um, and you see, at least qualitatively, in a 2D optimization problem, after uh, no more than 10 steps of optimization, this neural net makes some big jumps in the optimization landscape and then settles on something really close to the global maximum. And we can see this in these figures. So this is doing variational inference. Um, in this case, higher is better. And um, the blue line is the iterative, is the learn optimizer that uh, in Joe's work that basically uh, closes the amortization gap, but is still in this case, orders of magnitude faster than the standard optimizer. So for example, RMS prop in this case is the best performing optimizer for this particular case. And in this case, you see that um, basically in terms of number of iterations, Joe's approach iterative inference is you know, about 100 to 200 times faster. Let's say 100 times. Uh, it's hard to tell by looking at this particular plot. Uh, but let's say roughly 100 times faster in terms of number of iterations. So uh, possibly much more. Um, so so long as this 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 smaller neural this small neural net that's that's my learned optimizer, um, G this 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 G, as, so long as running the computation of this optimizer is less than a hundred times slower than the computation time of RMS prop, this is this is a faster um, algorithm. And in practice, uh, in this particular case, uh, Joe has verified that. Um, this approach is orders of magnitude faster in actual wall clock time than standard gradient-based optimizers. Any questions? Okay. So now we're gonna talk about something that we didn't cover in lecture one, which is meta learning. Uh, meta learning is work by uh, Chelsea Finn, Peter Beal, and Sergey Levine uh, from uh, 2017. Um, the basic idea is suppose we want to do uh, um, sort of domain adaptation at test time. So what does that mean? That means that we at training time we have this distribution of supervised learning problems. So we can think of these as different tasks. Each one uh, corresponds to a different um, to a different uh, loss function. And each one is associated with a very small training set, uh, although it can be big, but let's say small training set. Um, and then we assume that these learning problems or these tasks are related to each other. So in the simplest form of meta-learning, and it can get more, much more complicated, but we're just gonna talk about the simplest form. In the simplest form of meta-learning, uh, the goal is to learn this, the goal is to learn this two-step optimizer, where step one is an initial guess, theta naught, and step two is we're gonna, we can quickly fine tune theta naught to an individual task. And that's depicted in the, um, in the diagram in the bottom right, which is taken from the meta learning paper. Um, 
And so in its, in, in its simplest form, um, this is meta-learning as a computation graph, where we have a collection of loss functions uh, from different tasks that's, that's inputted. And then for, for each of them, we want to be able to minimize its loss. And, and we want, in this case, we're just gonna take one gradient step. So this is just one, this is basically saying we want to, we want to estimate a theta naught such that in one gradient step, we can uh, get to a theta star for that task. Of course, we do multiple gradient steps. We can also learn. We can also learn the optimizer in this black box rather than fixing it. So here we're 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 fixing the optimizer as standard gradient descent. We can also learn the optimizer as a black box. Uh, we can also run it for more than one time step. Um, but we also need to we also need to learn a theta naught over this collection of tasks. And the goal is, and. And so this is just an, another way of thinking about learning to optimize where the thing that we're exploiting here is that we have a family of, of related supervised learning tasks and we can learn a, a good preconditioner, if you will, or an initializer theta naught in addition to everything else that we've been talking about. And so long as at test time for our new task or a new, a new supervised learning problem that we're trying to optimize is related to all the training tasks, then this theta naught plus this optimizer, which could be learned, uh, will very, very quickly um, you know, learn, uh, learn to do well for this new task. And one of the side benefits is that it may, it may do so in a way that uh, where, this, where the learning task or the, at test time um, has very little training data as well. That's another side benefit that we haven't, that is not really the focus of this lecture. So the benefits of meta-learning is that it can quickly adapt to the new task at deployment time with possibly very little training data, uh, learn to share information across training tasks for fast adaptation, both in terms of training time and in terms of generalization power and sharing statistical strength. Um, and this is one figure from their paper um, where pre-trained corresponds to a neural net that was just pre-trained on all the training data and not fine tuned. And Oracle is the ground truth loss if you had all the training data. And so you can see that, you know, um, you really, um, you, you really can uh, learn faster with just, a, with just one or two gradient steps. Sorry, pre-trained. Sorry, pre-trained. I, I misspoke. Pre-trained corresponds to a pre-trained uh, to a pre-trained neural net that get, that gets that then gets fine-tuned in a normal way, whereas in in, in meta learning, um, you're learning an optimizer for the for the purposes of fast adaptation or in fast fine-tuning. So this is in, sen in a sense, this is basically learning to fine-tune to a new domain is another way of thinking about it. But we can actually think about, if I just go back to the previous slide, um, we can actually think about replacing, um, replacing, sorry, sorry, this portion with a learned optimizer as well. So we can combine the, 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 the core concept of meta-learning with the core concept of a, of a, of a learned grading-based optimizer. Uh, we, we can combine these two, and this, that is, of course, an interesting, um, Topic for a research project if, you're, if that's something you're interested in. Any questions? Yes, question, Aiden. How much work has been done in uh, trying to understand how information can be shared among different tasks? Uh, that's a great question. Um, Truthfully, I don't know. Um, you know, this is not an area that meta learning is not an area that I've spent a lot of time working on myself. Um, I, you know, I, obviously the intuition is that you know the, the training tasks have to be related somehow, and the test tasks have to be related to the training tasks. Obviously, that intuition is there. You're asking the question of empirically, what does that mean? 
Uh, we're going to be updating <laughs> the course website with the references with as many papers as we can find. Uh, if you have things you want to add to the course website, just send me an email. Um, truthfully, I don't know. Uh, this is not an area that I've done a lot of nitty gritty research on. So truthfully, I don't know. Uh, if there's something you're interested in, I just, I guess, you know, since this is a graduate level seminar project based class, I guess I would just invite you to look at the references and sort of, uh, look at the literature yourself. Thanks. Second question. Yeah, I think mine is similar. Um, are there some ways to test how related one pro how related your new problem is to the problems you've trained on? So, okay. So, so the general way to ask, to ascertain this is, um, of course, it's, it's a very unsatisfactory answer is we do cross validation, right? We have, um, a set of a hundred tasks. We want to, want to figure out how related they are to each other. So we're going to try to weird different ways of partitioning the tasks and see what does well, and what doesn't do well. And from that, you can, you know, see that, oh, these collection of 10 tasks are more related to each other because by cross validation, they work well together and not and less so with these other 10. So the generic answer if in the, in the absence of anything else is always different ways of doing cross validation. So you can do meta cross validation in some sense. So that's the generic answer. Uh, I know that's not very satisfactory, but you know, in, in, when we do research, um, and that's always a, a reasonable starting point to just get insight and intuition about the problem. Um, the second answer, which is um, not something that I was planning on focusing on, is that you can actually um, potentially do meta-meta learning, where you um, have some attributes of this learning problem. So you can featureize your learning problem. That, that's, that's possible to do. And then you, you learn based on features of your learning problem, which, which subsets of the data to, to meta learn from. So that's another layer of, of, of computation. So one of the things, maybe one thing to, to think about in this, in this diagram is that this is a nested computation graph. Suppose we're learning this uh, gradient based optimizer, this, this big rectangle, rectangular box in the bottom. Suppose we're learning that as a learned optimizer and we're learning this theta naught. Right, so this is a nested computation graph from that perspective that we're doing two levels of nested learning. We can do a third level of nested learning where we're learning to select which training sets to learn from. So we do a three level nested learning. And if you can make that whole thing differentiable, then you could potentially do that. I do not know if anyone has done that. Again, this is not an area that I'm personally is like, mid, uh, like actively involved in in day-to-day -day research. Uh, we're gonna do some more literature reviews. If you find papers that are relevant, please email them to me or add it to the course website. Uh, if an, an exploration of something like that could be an interesting um, research project for this class. Uh, any qu other questions? Okay, so moving on, um, the next two bullet points will be a little bit shorter. Um, uh, embedding differentiable optimization inside neural networks. Um, so the story so far right now is that we have this optimization problem, L, uh, and we, we, have, we want to train an iterative optimizer, like a gradient-based optimizer, um, to optimize L. And we assume everything is differentiable, and we also assume that L is completely well-defined. So for example, when L is the is defined by the lot the, by the supervised learning loss of a larger neural net then in some sense it's completely well defined and we just need to figure out how to optimize its landscape but this isn't always the case so uh, to to sort of arrive at this perspective let's think about um a, a, an alternative perspective and so to do so we're going to look at opnet which is work by um brandon amos and zico coulter at carnegie mellon uh, first appeared at ICML, um, I believe it was ICML 2017. Um, so um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at a quadratic program. Um, and so some of this may be a little bit um, uh, uh, outside the scope of your knowledge if you haven't taken uh, optimization. So if you've taken um, ACM 113, this should be largely reviewed. If you haven't taken ACM 113, I'm going to sort of give, just give you enough intuition of what's happening and so you understand the general idea. 
uh, and, and, and yeah, and then we'll go from there. So a quadratic program says, uh, I, want, I, I want to find the theta that minimizes the, uh, uh, this uh, quadratic loss function subject to linear constraints. So this is an optimization problem. If the, if the parameters of this optimization problem, capital Q, little q, capital A, little b, capital G, little c, are completely uh, specified, this is a relatively easy problem to solve because this, this is a convex optimization problem. It's, it's relatively easy to solve. So now the question is, can we learn what these parameters are, capital Q, little q, capital A, little b, capital G, uh, little c, not capital C, excuse me. Um, can we learn the parameters uh, of this optimization problem such that the solution of this optimization problem gives me what I want? So in other words, suppose that these parameters of the optimization problem were outputs of a neural net. So in other words, we're going to have a neural net where we, where, the, where we have an optimization layer inside the neural net. So the actual optimization problem, so you, you can use an existing solver to solve this optimization problem, which is, in this case, the optimization problem is easy once you've specified the parameters of, it, of the optimization. Um, and so we have some input, call it X, and we're going to pass it through, in this case, just a feed for neural network. And then the outputs of the feed for neural network are basically the, 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 the parameters of this optimization problem. And we run this optimization problem and we get uh, an output. So that's the basic idea. So what are some properties of an optimal solution of this optimization problem? So uh, for those of you who've taken, um, so this, the, the general idea should be, should be familiar to anyone who's taken CS155, because we talked about Lagrangians. Uh, this in particular is, the, is a Lagrangian of a QP. Um, so I just wrote out a Lagrangian. Um, oops. And the thing that I wanted to talk about are the KKT conditions, which are satisfied at optimality. So if you have the optimal solution of this Lagrangian, then we, we know that these KKT conditions are satisfied at optimality. Uh, for those of you who uh, aren't as familiar with KKT conditions, uh, don't, don't worry, it's, it's, it's okay. We can follow along without knowing the details, but just keep in mind that this is loosely analogous to the to optimality condition of gradient descent, which is that the gradient equals zero, right? That's, the optimal, that's an optimality condition of gradient descent, is that at optimality, the gradient is zero. For these quadratic, uh, for this particular quadratic optimization problem with linear constraints, um, the the, the KKT conditions I, you can think of as the analogy that must be satisfied at optimality. Okay, so we're going to look at just one of the one of the KKT conditions, the simplest one. Um, if, just for the purposes of illustration, and suppose that you know again, capital A and little b are outputs of neural nets. So A is a matrix, B is a vector, and they're out there the outputs of a neural net. Then taking the differential of this, of this, um, of this constraint yields the following form. This is just chain rule. And without going into all the details, this implies that we can do the following. We can differentiate through the KKT conditions um, in other words, we can characterize how the solution of the QP changes uh, differential in a differentiable way as, a, as a, in its relationship to the to the parameterizations of, the, of its outputs. Which means that we can apply chain rule. Once we do that, we can apply chain rule uh, through this the solution of this optimization problem. So we so, let's say we've solved this optimization problem for 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 a fixed Q, Q, A, B, G, C, for we, we've solved this solution of the optimization problem. Now we, want, we ask the question, for, once we've solved the solution of this optimization problem, suppose we want to change the parameters of, of Q, Q, A, B, G, C so that the, its parameters change a little bit. Then to, by differentiating through the KKD conditions, 
we can we can talk about how everything changes, and then we can apply the chain rule onto the feed for neural network part. So again, I'm not going to go into the details, but that's the basic idea. And so if you have an optimization problem where you have some conditions at optimality, you know, one question is, you know, can we just like treat that as a layer of a neural net? In this case, it's it's not a feed, it's not a, a simple layer, it's um you know, it's an optimization layer. Uh, any questions about this, at least at a high level? Okay, so here's an example, Sudoku. Um, so the trend, the, so the input is a partially filled in Sudoku puzzle. That's the X. And I'll just call theta the fully filled in one, just, just to keep the notation consistent in the lecture, although they call it Y in their paper. Um, uh, so the, the, the output is this fully uh, filled in um, Sudoku. And you can pick some standard supervised training loss. They pick squared loss. So they have a supervised training set uh, where they, where you know, you want to predict theta that minimizes squared loss of the ground with the true theta, which is the, which is the solution to the Sudoku. And so we're going to. So the prediction of theta is basically the prediction of this optimization problem subject to constraints. And you know, they showed in their paper um, that. Um, oops. This, I think, is not the figure I wanted to show. <laughs> there was, oh no, this is the figure I wanted to show. So that they can learn, uh, you know, about as well as a convolutional neural net at test time, and they don't overfit, which is interesting. Um, it, you know, a convolutional neural net basically treats X as an image, and then, and then, and then it, it does the comp sequence of convolutions over this. One of the things that a convolutional neural net may, may have a hard time learning is you know, that constraints need to be satisfied. For example, you know, every row and every column has to have exactly one of each number. That's a constraint that needs to be satisfied. If you, don't know, if, you don't know, if you actually don't know that that's a constraint that needs to be satisfied, then how do you learn that? Can you learn that implicitly inside the neural net? And that's one of the arguments for OpNet. They've since extended OpNet in uh, many different ways. So there are follow-up papers. Uh, you can see that on the course website where they can significantly outperform convolutional neural nets. Well, but this particular figure demonstrates that they don't, uh, that they can act, that they're, they're potentially, uh, this, optim, uh, this OpNet architecture is actually learning the constraints of what, it, what are valid solutions uh, of Sudoku. And that's why you don't see this overfitting that you see in convolutional neural nets, which would be the first thing you try because you, you know, with a standard neural net architecture, because you treat this as an image. So in other words, if you think that there are rules or constraints that govern what the solution should look like, then, then you, know, um, uh, you can learn that in the A, B, G, and C, right? A, B, and G, and C are constraints. You, you don't allow the solutions to violate these constraints. So, so um, for example, learning that each row and each column should have exactly one of each number could be encoded in, in AX of theta equals B of X. Implicitly, it could be encoded implicitly. Of course, you need to visualize what the neural net is learning. But this is, this is a structure that makes it easier to learn those type of constraints, whereas convolutional neural nets is a structure that makes it easy to learn things that obey or, or enjoy translation invariance. Any questions? Okay, so the final topic is just a very brief uh, discussion of reinforcement learning when learning is not differentiable. Um, 
So learning to optimize in a non-differentiable case. Suppose we don't have access to the gradient. Um, there are other cases where learning is not differentiable, but let's just consider this one. Suppose we don't have access to the gradient. So, you know, we only, um, we, we can only measure the point-wise loss. So we can only measure what the loss is. We don't know what the gradient of the loss is. So to recap, um, policy learning, both reinforcement and imitation learning, we have, uh, uh, and this is, this is using a reinforcement learning uh, notation. So state in our case would be theta and action would be the, the new theta or the, or the update to theta. But this is the generic reinforcement learning notation. The environment of the world is the lost landscape and the agent is our optimizer. Um, the goal is to find an agent that you know, maximizes reward. Uh, in reinforcement learning, that's the environment reward. So let's say, let's say we can only measure the loss function. We, can, we don't know its gradient. So we only have zeroth order measurements of the loss function. Um, so this is, this is reinforcement learning. And the simplest algorithm is called reinforce. And there are much more complicated reinforcement learning algorithms, but I just want to show the simplest one. Um, suppose we had a policy. Uh, that outputs a distribution over actions. Parameter, again, this policy is parameters by phi. Um, so, you know, basically, if we, quote, if we do what's called a rollout of a policy, then in step one of the, the reinforced algorithm, we sample trajectories because the policy actually, instead of predicting, um, instead of predicting a deterministic, instead of predicting a, 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 these output arrows of the computation graph, instead of them being deterministic, let's say they're stochastic. They're, they're, they're the, the output of distribution, and then we sample from that distribution. What, and what that means that we, is that we can sample a sequence, these trajectories. And we can measure the, the pointwise loss of these trajectories. So we can measure, we can measure the loss at each um, theta sub t, um, but we cannot um, measure the gradient of the loss with respect to theta. And then we, by, by, by in, endowing H with the distribution, we can, you know, use that distribution to smooth out the loss. That's step two. So the gradient of the loss with respect to phi is the smooth version of this loss where we only have pointwise measurements of the loss function. If you don't know reinforcement learning, it's okay. Um, this is just um, this is just to, to get you to, to understand that what we're doing here is sampling and smoothing, and then we can basically have this this smooth gradient. We can do gradient descent on our on our on our, on our learned optimizer who with parameters phi. So that's the basic idea. And so, in the context of learning to optimize. You know, reinforcement learning can be thought of as sampling-based optimization, right? So, you know, in, in you know, the, the types of reinforcement learning that we, 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 we've uh, heard and seen in the past, like playing Atari, you know, in the beginning, the agent tries a random sequence of actions and see what reward it gets. And from that, it learns how to make clever, more clever sequences of actions that get high reward. Here, it's like we, we take random trajectories in this optimization landscape and see what the loss function is in this optimization landscape, which is our environmental reward. And we learn through that sampling, we learn to make in more intelligent sequences of optimization steps to minimize the loss. So of course, we wanna make this as differentiable as possible. That's what the last bullet point is. But you know, the, the assumption is that you know, there's some aspect of this problem that's not differentiable. And if you cannot differentiate through it, through it the, then you can only sample it and then do a smooth estimate and do a gradient of this smooth, smooth estimate. Any questions? Okay, so uh, just to briefly, uh, one slide, talk about uh, this paper, Neuro Optimizer Search with Reinforcement Learning, this appeared at ICML 2017 from Google Brain. Um, this is, uh, in a nutshell, what they did. Of course, uh, there were, it, their actual setup is more complicated. 
And what they were interested in is not only finding an optimizer uh, that, that performed really well, but also to actually try to, you know, put, uh, maybe put a little bit more structure into the optimizer, even though the whole thing is, the, the policy class is differentiable, and to see, you know, what kind of optimization rules um, are, um, are, are learned. So are there new optimization principles that can be discovered? And so they uh, had two different classes of optimizers. And um, this is just showing that these optimizers outperformed um, standard gradient-based optimizers in the, in the right plot. I guess I should mention uh, right here that, you know, as you move towards reinforcement learning, uh, learning these optimizers start getting more and more expensive because sampling is extremely expensive. If you, if you don't have a fully differentiable problem, or you're not Bayesian and use a, using a Gaussian process like in the previous lecture and, you, and you're trying to train a neural net with sampling, it is extremely expensive. So, so if you are thinking of doing, um, if you're thinking of doing um, a research project on you know, reinforcement learning, just, you know, of course, uh, if you're really interested in that area, you should absolutely go for it. But just keep in mind that you know, it's gonna be a little bit of a heavier computational burden to do such a project. Any questions? Okay, so uh, lecture on Thursday, we'll be doing learning to optimize for discrete optimization problems rather than continuous optimization problems. That's it for today.